the equation was a simple one. More railways meant more deaths. The 1860s were the darkest decade, when accidents were rarely out of the nation's news. These smashes, as they were known, magnetized and repelled the Victorians. Here was a very modern way to die. In the 1860s, um, really the railways were at their most dangerous. The trains began to speed up. We had 50, 60 mile an hour trains sometimes. There were more trains on the track, so the likelihood of collisions was, was increased. But the authorities did very little about safety, really until... <laughs> The railways were losing their gothic aspect. An age of railway romance was emerging, in which they became something that could be romanticised, sentimentalised, loved. For the railway children, the country station is both a rural idyll and a joy. Come on! Nesbitt writes, the rocks and hills and... Mr Brown, the signalman. At the same time, railway stories were being written for children in their thousands. Life or death, an Indian railway yard. The missing mailbag. The railway started attracting followings amongst young people, probably from the turn of the 20th century, although train spotting as such didn't emerge till, till, till rather later. But, but uh, I think, you know, people would go to the seaside on the, on the railway and, they, and their whole family would go and they'd, they'd take the huge trunk in the, in, in the goods van and luggage van and then they'd sit in a compartment all together, all eagerly going off to the seaside. It, it was, uh, you know, lots of people have written about that as, you know, the most exciting thing they did in their childhood. Trees and trees, the canal and, above all, the railway were so new and so pleasing that the remembrance of the old life in the villa grew to seem almost like a dream. Does it look spiffing? It's like a sort of green dragon. A fiery green dragon. It's funny! I waved and it was so bad! Got to the little bird. You don't need to be cutting. Come on. Oh, look! An old man's way back. Race you to the station. Peter, do you think we should cross the line? Why not? The train's gone. There won't be another one for ages. Well, I will, but I think it's dangerous. Come on. The railway children really showed that the railways had become a totally accepted part of, of life. Um, you know, they'd been around by then for 60, 70 years, and um, people saw them as the way into the big town and the way back from the, from the big town. You know, there was something terribly comforting about it. You know, people relied on the railway. It was the thing on which they depended for nearly every aspect of their lives. Called the railways play a very charming role in this. I mean, they are, for a start, kind of morally neutral, unlike the people who've locked up the dad. Um, and they have nice, nice Mr. Perks, the porter, who's part of the landscape as well. And they're lovely things to go and watch, and they're free to go and watch. They're just part of the scenery, so you don't have to pay money to go and watch them. And it's a lovely thing to do, as it was in my childhood as well, to go and stand on a railway cutting edge and watch trains was a thing that we did. No, stay away! Why? It's because we've got the watches and we're heroes! Off you go, lessons. Rather later, until, until the 1880s. So we had this decade, uh, 1860s, where more people died on the railways than ever before or since. Cartoonists portrayed the locomotives as beasts, dragon-like. They were bent on the destruction of mere humans. Returning from France on June 9, 1865, all of Charles Dickens' railway nightmares came true when he was involved in a horrific train crash at Staplehurst in Kent. The accident was caused by a work gang lifting tracks on a viaduct. They had reckoned without the 238 from Folkestone to London.
Dickens helped soothe the injured and the dying with a flask of brandy and his top hat filled with cold water. Ten people died in the accident, and for the rest of his life, all Dickens' various anxieties would be subsumed in the Great One over Staplehurst. After the war, Britain looked to the future, and we became a self-consciously modern society. While the newly nationalised railways trundled on, the feeling of affection we'd built up for rail over the 20th century was transferred, for a while at least, to the motor car. The motor car, until after the Second World War, is not very well developed, but after the Second World War, really takes off as the way to travel. Everybody wants to, uh, you know, own a, a motor car and a television set and get hooked up on the telephone. That's, that's their aim in life. It's not to take a, rail, a, a, a train anywhere. So uh, that's when the romance starts wearing off. For Betjeman, much of the railway's appeal was its permanence. It was a very useful bequest from our forefathers. As he writes in Pershaw Station, the Victorian world and the present in a moment's neighbourhood. In his poetry, the railway station often stands for a world that is disappearing or has vanished completely. This is a monody on the death of Aldersgate Street Station. Snow falls in the buffet of Aldersgate Station. Soot hangs in the tunnel in clouds of steam. City of London, before the next desecration, let your steepled forest of churches be my theme. Betjeman's poetry and prose seem to allied churches and railway stations, with both offering a refuge from the modern world. I find it very apt that he was behind the campaign to save St Pancras from demolition. St Pancras, after all, is both a Christian saint and a railway station. Betterman is really at the root of the Railway Preservation Society. He tried to save uh, the Euston Arch and, and got involved in that. They lost that campaign. Um, but then in the uh, 1960s, there was a plan to demolish St Pancras. Seems extraordinary now, but uh, uh, you know he was very active in ensuring that did not happen, and that St Pancras, this great Gothic cathedral, our greatest uh, railway building, was not demolished. And and his efforts are now demonstrated by the fact there is a statue of Betjeman in in St Pancras Station. I'm the last of the blood and sweat. There's no doubt that a diesel train is less inspiring than a steam engine. I think people start losing their fondness for it as steam is phased out. It doesn't inspire any poetry. I think if, if there hadn't been steam engines, there'd been uh, diesel engines straight away. I don't think we'd have half the uh, literature about the railways that we have. <laughs> 